Well, welcome to this week's edition of the Crops TV. My name is Erica Lundy. I serve as the Extension Beef Specialist in Southwest Iowa. Um, and today I'm going to talk a little bit about using cover crops as a forage resource. So obviously the popularity of cover crops has really been on the rise the last several years. And with that increase in the use, it really offers a, an opportunity for our beef cattle in the state to capitalize on the extra forage resource that's available. So um, today I'm gonna to share some tips for utilizing cover crops as a forage resource. Um, and obviously we know there's a lot of variability that goes into um, establishing cover crops successfully. Uh, so Mother Nature provides enough of those challenges anyway. So we're gonna talk on some uh, BMPs for efficiently and economically using those cover crops as a forage resource. So we all know that our annual forages can provide lots of benefits uh, to our farming enterprises. So for example, a lot of those agronomic benefits like the soil and wind protection from erosion, uh, we can reduce weed pressure, improve some soil health, that water infiltration, all of those things are, are big advantages for using cover crops. But a lot of times we don't necessarily think about some of those advantages that can happen when we are looking at adding that beef cow enterprise into the operation. So we're going to focus a little bit more on some of those things like providing that flexibility so we can share some of those costs of establishments of cover ups between the typical row crop and the farming enterprise. Row crops are a great way to extend the grazing season. So there's a lot of um, spa business record data that shows that the more days that we graze throughout the year in a beef cow operation, the more likely that we are to be profitable. And of course, cover crops are a, a high quality forage resource to meet the needs of those requirements of cattle. And then also to using cover crops as a way to reduce some of the, the feed costs and labor from the standpoint of uh, delivering stored feed that we typically would during this time when we could be grazing cover crops. So I wanted to kind of use this um, uh, graphic here to kind of put together how cover crops can fit into um, our operations. So the first bar there would be our cool season pasture. So typically we'll send cows to pasture um, April timeframe. Our cool season pastures are pretty productive through June, um, but then we start to hit that summer slump where our productivity starts to fall off. Then in the fall, that August timeframe, we, nice, we see another nice benefit of those um, uh, pastures coming back to life, get some good grazing days from that fall. The next line there would be our row crops. So typically mid-April through May is when we would plant. They're actively growing until fall when we come in and harvest those. So now when we add our cool seasons, um, typically depending on um, our scenario and our row crop enterprise, we are likely to um, start seeding those maybe in late August um, into September. So this would be if we're doing some inner seeding or maybe after corn silage. But in a good year, we can start to see some of that forage that's available for grazing as early as October, November, even through some of those winter months. And then again, in the spring too, prior to planting our, our cash crop there, we have some opportunities to do some grazing as well. So today we're strictly gonna focus on some of the cool seasons, but I also wanted to um, put in a pitch for some of those warm seasons. So these are annuals that we would plant in um, kind of that late May, June, July timeframe that are something that we can graze 30 to um, 45, maybe even 60, depending on the species throughout that summer months. So this typically is when we see that summer slump of our cool season pastures. So there's definitely some opportunities there um, to extend the grazing season using these annuals. Um, specifically those cool seasons is what we're gonna focus on the rest of today's presentation. So our outline, we're gonna start with some tips for success. So I mentioned earlier, cover crops have become pretty popular, but there's still a lot of questions in terms of making the most of cover crops as a forage resource. So some of those tips for getting those cover crops established when our goal is that forage production. Um, there are some grazing issues that come along with cover crops. So they're not very common, but we wanna make sure producers are aware of those. Uh, throughout the presentation, we'll share a lot of some of the Iowa State research that's been going on with grazing cover crops. And then we'll kind of end the session with some uh, best management practices or BMPs that are um, told by producers from a survey that we have conducted in, in the past. All right, so number one for our tips for success is to make sure that we're looking at those pesticide label restrictions. 
Um, so obviously those are on the label for a reason. So we wanna make sure that we're checking them um, and that we are, are meeting those restrictions so that we don't have issues with that cover crop either failing in general, never emerging, or if we have some residue risk that could be a problem when we're grazing those cover crops. Something important to keep in mind is that we are using species, um, optimizing our planning timeframe, all of those things based on when we want to harvest or graze a cover crop. So whether that's in the spring or the fall, we'll dictate some of those things that we're utilizing. Of course, to look for options to maximize when we want to uh, be grazing or harvesting that. So um, obviously on our, our row crop side that we might have to give a little if we're gonna maximize that forage production um, and, and use some ways there to make sure that we have that forage available during that time frame when we really want it. And then of course to make sure that um, what species we're using will kind of match that feed quality considerations that we have. So the really nice thing about cover crops is typically we will terminate those, whether that's from grazing, mechanically harvest, and then come in and terminate. Um, prior, before that plant really reaches maturity, and we see that plant send up that seed head or reach that reproductive stage. So in the graph down here on the right, we can kind of see that that early reproductive stage is where we would maximize our yield potential. And this is typically when we would uh, graze or terminate this forage. So cover crop yield, um, obviously our, our yield depends on a lot of factors with number one being that weather. So weather plays a key role in uh, how successful we can get that cover crop established early and what that growth looks like. Our seeding date, method and rate are also important as well. So typically in a, a grazing scenario, we are looking at maybe almost doubling what we would typically seed as our rate for our cover crop establishment if we're just doing uh, cover crops for an agronomic benefit. So most cases of their cool seasons are somewhere in that one and a half to two bushels per acre. Um, the next two bullet points here are kind of looking at what to expect in terms of grazing days. So um, looking at fall grazing days, so some producer survey data that the Beef Center has done has indicated roughly 28 days is what producers that are utilizing cover crops as a forage resource can expect for grazing in the fall. Um, some of the Iowa State research that we have done has been much less, so more in that eight days on average um, that we have available for grazing. On the spring side, um, we can get uh, fewer days typically just because we're kind of pushing up against that termination date to make sure that we get that cash crop established on the right time. So both the, the producer data and our ISC research has shown about 18 days on average that we can have spring grazing. This slide and the next one um, are both depicting the same thing. And what we're really looking at here is the difference we see in yield based off of our planning date. So in, in this picture on the right, obviously that cover crop, that cereal rye that's growing there, looks to be much taller and thicker than the one on the left. So just a, a few weeks there can make a big difference in terms of what we can expect for that forage quality. This is looking at some radishes and turnips. Um, uh, again, the same scenario here. The ones on the right were planted a, a couple of weeks before the ones on the left. And we can see that there's a big difference in, in both that, um, that root of those plants as well as the leaf area above. So again, just the sooner we get that cover crop established, the more likely we are that we're going to have sufficient forage to graze. This slide here is kind of a summary of a two-year project that our beef and agronomy extension teams have done with our ISU outline research farms, um, looking at our fall yield of cover crops. So this data here would be from 2018 and 19 in the fall. Uh, we were seeding cereal rye at one bushel per acre, as well as oats at one bushel per acre. Um, and so you can see in 2018, our fall was much more um, supportive, beneficial for our forage growth than it was in 2019. So 2018, uh, those forage samples would have been taken after a uh, killing frost when we were getting ready to graze that cover crop. And then in 2019, if you uh, might remember, we had a, a harsh cold killing frost that come in early um, and with this studies, it actually happened in October prior to our cash crop coming out. 
So there wasn't much opportunity for there for our cover crop uh, to be grazed that fall. Um, I'll also mention here, uh, it did kind of appear at um, our Western farm there where we did see about 300 pounds of dry matter per acre of that cover crop, that there was much more that was available um, prior to harvest. So this would have been interseeded into our um, standing cash crop. And it appeared there was much more forage there than when we actually came through and, and harvested those soybeans in this scenario. Um, and we think a lot of that is due to just um, our combine head was actually cutting off some of that forage when we were combining those beans. So something to keep in mind too. So interseeding is a great opportunity to get that cover crop established earlier, but then we have to find the happy medium where that cover crop's not too tall that we're actually hindering that when we are harvesting our cash crop yet. So this is a very similar study at the same outlying farms, but just looking at our spring yield of those cover crops. Um, so uh, cereal rye would have been our predominant forage that remained after the, the winter. So this would have been sampling um, at the termination of the cover crop just prior to that. So we're looking at that total yield. So um, as we had grazed in the spring, we had some strips that were left so we could do some yield checks. And that's what this data is. Um, so you can see there were some years at some farms where we didn't have a cover crop there um, to graze or to even sample. Um, but really kind of want to want to point out is the average location that summary and bold down at the bottom. So uh, lots of variation. Obviously, some of this in terms of our yield is based off of whether we were following corn or soybeans. And then, of course, to what cash crop we were going into in the spring where our, our fields that were going into corn would have been terminated a little bit quicker than those going into soybeans. So in general there, you can see um, lots of variation across our locations. Um, obviously sampling date, those cash crops that were available were all things that were playing a key role in how much spring forage we had available to graze. Another thing we wanna mention here is just the, the variation in the yield and the quality of the cover crop. So this table is looking at some of those feed value characteristics that we often look at um, from our forages. So this too would be summarized from five years of our spring data um, at the ISU McNay farm that's in, in Lucas County down in Southern Iowa. And so this is all from the same field, just different samples taken out throughout the five years. Um, and you can see we kind of have the average there. And then on the right would be that the range of what we saw. So our yield, anywhere from um, basically a 10th of a ton per acre to 1.3 tons per acre is what we saw. Um, dry matter, the DM, um, so we're just shy of 18%. So this is a pretty wet feed stuff that we're dealing with when we're grazing cover crops. So that's something to keep in mind too, and, and we'll touch on that more later. Crude protein, um, lots of variation there again too, but in general, we were a pretty high quality feed stuff and above what our beef cow requirements would be um, as well. Our ADF and our NDF would be our fiber values. Uh, these are pretty low and that's basically because our cover crop is pretty vegetative. So there's not much fiber. So we see fiber increase as those plants get more mature. And then our TDN, total digestible nutrients, that would be our energy value. And again, pretty high in energy, which would be above what our typical beef cow requirements would be. All right, so jumping into some grazing issues here. So the moisture content is a, a big one we wanna make sure we touch on and make sure that producers are aware of this. So our brassica species, those turnips and radishes are typically about 90% water. So lots of moisture in this feed stuff. Uh, our cereal grains, so that cereal rye, wheat, some of those um, are typically somewhere in that 80, um, excuse me, 70 to 80% moisture at boot stage. So. This would just be prior to um, the setting up that reproductive head and terminating that cover crop. So even when those plants are getting pretty mature, there's still a lot of moisture in them. And then on the flip side, just to put it in a general comparison, um, our corn stalks are about 10% uh, moisture. So they're on the opposite end where there's lots of dry matter there. So uh, a lot of times in the fall, if we can get that cover crop established, um, having that corn stock residue to graze as well as that cereal rye or whatever form of cover crop is a really good blend for those cows. 
So question we often get is if we're dealing with this high of a moisture of a forage resource, can our cattle actually consume enough? And just a, a quick math problem here. Um, so if we're looking at a 1,350 pound cow, general thumb rule tells us she's gonna eat about two and a half percent of her body weight. So on a dry matter basis, she would be eating about 35 pounds per day. So we just said that our cover crop is about 80% moisture or 20% dry matter. So again, a very wet forage resource we're working with. So she needs to eat about 170 pounds of that forage. So there's um, some questions uh, between the extension teams and, and others too on whether this is possible for um, an animal to eat this much. So it's more likely that a cow probably can, but if we have calves or soccer cattle that are grazing, um, it's likely that they won't be able to eat enough of this forage to actually get the nutrients out of it. So while cover crops are really high and good feed quality value, um, good resource from that perspective, we do need to make sure that we're supplementing some type of a, uh, another forage or supplement out there just so that we can make sure that they are getting enough to eat just because of the high moisture content. So um, supplementing while um, grazing is a, a good uh, best management practice when we're grazing cover crops. This is a summary of our forage samples that we have were taken over five years um, on our research project that I've mentioned. And, and just wanna kind of point out here, kind of what we were seeing for values. So those in red would be our pre-grazing and those in yellow would be the post-grazing. So obviously as that plant matures, we go over time, we start to see a little bit of an increase in that dry matter content. Um, but there's not a whole lot of change there. So other grazing issues that might be um, something to, to watch out for. So one of the purposes for using our cover crops is to um, retain some of those nutrients in the soil so we're not losing them. Um, and so nitrates and sulfur are things that would um, be potentially of a, a concern or risk when grazing cover crops. So if we're in a highly fertilized field, um, we've seen uh, some drought areas. We had a lot of fields that were um, impacted by the dratio as well. And so we might have some issues coming next um, this fall or maybe even to the spring where that cash crop didn't utilize all the nitrogen that was applied. So our cover crops may be high in that nitrate um, risk from there. Something else to keep in mind is the sulfur toxicity. And this is more so with our brassicas. Uh, those radishes and turnips are naturally higher in sulfur than some of the others. So um, just make sure we're aware of that if we're grazing a, a field that has several brassicas or turnips that are available. We often recommend seeding a brassicas with some type of a small grain forage as well, just because our brassicas are very high in nutrient content. Um, it's more like feeding corn grain itself than a forage resource. So unfortunately, these two things, we can't uh, just know if a field is going to be a, a risk or not. Um, so we have to test that forage to be able to see if that's an issue. Um, if it is an issue, then we can manage it by um, controlling animal intake. So reducing access to those fields or providing some other hay or supplements too, so that we're diluting that animal intake of this um, high sulfur or nitrate forage resource. And something else too to watch for is grass tetany. Um, so basically this is something that we typically um, hear of uh, an issue in spring calving cows when they first go to grass in the spring. Um, so same kind of setup here. Basically what we have is um, our plants are very high in moisture and protein content, but it's low in some of those um, other mineral nutrients. And so we have an imbalance in the animal system um, that can cause some issues as well. So. Uh, good practice if you feed um, high magnesium mineral um, before going to pasture, but if you're grazing cover crops, maybe that's something to consider as well. Um, and again, just to mention that typically it takes a little bit of time to prime the animal system. So we recommend uh, feeding that high mag mineral prior to turnout. So these issues, um, typically not a, a huge concern. Um, but it is something that we have heard some cases where they have been issues with grazing cover crops before. So we just wanna make sure that uh, producers are aware of the potential risk here. So probably the two biggest things we hear for um, producers on while, what's the, the concern of grazing 
uh, cover crops. So the one would be kind of some of that fencing limitation. And then the other is the risk of soil compaction. And so with our grazing studies, our agronomy team took a bunch of soil samples and we're really trying to measure um, soil compaction via uh, that bulk density. So you can see here, we have um, some images down in the left side there that showed the differences between non-compacted and compacted soils. So obviously compaction is a concern because it risks some of that water infiltration. And then two, if it's severe enough, it can have some issues with um, our root growth and development of plants. So this is some data from our study. Um, you can see here taken over four years at, on one field. Um, and so we took samples in the fall, so that would be our fall baseline, and this would be after that cash crop had came off, but our cover crop hadn't really been established yet. And then we took samples in the spring again after we had grazed, and then of course too, we had our treatments where we did not have a, a cover crop that was not grazed, or we did have a cover crop, but it was not grazed as well. So um, in, in general here, um, basically, there's not a whole lot of change in our numbers that we saw in terms of our bulk density, and there was no statistical difference, but obviously there is kind of some noise some fluctuation in what um, those bulk density numbers look like. Our agronomists tell me that um, typically a uh, bulk density number of 1.44 grams per cubic centimeter um, is kind of that threshold for where we start to see some um, risk of that compaction concerns. And so um, for the most part here, these numbers are below that threshold. So we would not expect to see any differences here um, from grazing those cover crops that we might have some impact on that cash crop. So some tips for managing this. Um, this is really kind of the same scenario as grazing corn stalks. So obviously we, we create some soil roughness, which can be some issues for planting especially if we're in a no-till situation. If possible, try to graze these cover crops when our ground is frozen, just so we don't have that compaction risk. And then two, look for ways where we can avoid those areas of congregation with beef cows. So that might be our water area, the feeding area, some of those places. So if we can try to move those around, we decrease that risk of compaction. I want to touch real quick on a um, fall grazing study with cover crops that we are doing at the beef teaching farm up in Ames. Um, and so this is a, a project that was started to compare management of um, the fall herd at the teaching farm. So typically those fall herd cows are managed in a dry lot setting and um, our, uh, the farm manager wanted to look at comparing our, our cover crop grazing to that typical dry lot scenario and look at some of the performance and our um, economics of those two scenarios. So this is data from um, our 2018 grazing season. So this is a project that we have repeated more than once. Um, in some years we have not had enough forage to graze and in others we've had um, some pretty good forage to graze. So just to start with our cows. So um, obviously these were fall calving cows grazing in the fall. So these cows had their calves on side. We um, saw that both of our, our control group, which would be our dry lot and the cover crop group lost body weight during the study. Not surprising just because they are in peak lactation and that's pretty standard for females during that time frame. Where we saw some cool data was with our calves. So those calves that were on the, the cover crop study had um, about eight tenths of a pound more of an average daily gain weight advantage over those that were in the, the dry lot setting. So this could be simply because those calves were eating that feed, that cover crop resource um, just right alongside their dams or potentially too, the milk quality of those dams could be higher just because they were grazing a higher quality feed resource. We followed these calves through weaning and um, they actually were all managed the same once they um, ended off this study, they went into the same management scenario so they were managed consistently. But our weaning weight of those calves on the cover crop study maintained that weight advantage. So that was a, a big benefit. They had that earlier um, high quality feed stuff earlier in life and that did have a benefit to those calves. <clears throat> 
Next two slides are really kind of looking at um, putting some economic value to cover crops. And there's multiple ways to do this. And so it's just kind of um, different scenarios that we're gonna throw at you here. So on this study with the, the data that we showed, basically we had over two tons of dry matter of the cover crop per acre was our forage yield. We were able to graze this for 34 days. And so I'm gonna use the assumption that our hay price is $1.25 um, per ton. Um, roughly what I used in this scenario was 45 pounds um, of intake. So obviously that's gonna be a, a little bit of feed waste would be included in that estimate as well. But when we do the math and figure out um, how much hay we would be feeding these females if, if they weren't grazing the cover crop for 35 days, and then uh, account for that hay price there, basically we had a hay savings of $95 for this grazing period or $2.80 per cow per day. So of course this is strictly just looking at um, what it would have cost us to feed hay to her and does not account for what that cover crop establishment cost might be. Um, but in general, we know that that's probably gonna be less than that $2.80 per head per day. So just looking at this in another way, um, our math there for our, our stored feed is just like what that example we just walked through. So again, we're at that $2.80 per cow per day to feed her that stored hay. And then obviously that doesn't include our labor and some of those other expenses as well. If we want to look at it from what it costs us to establish that cover crop, um, we can use the assumption of roughly $50 per acre. And so this would account for um, actually running that drill to establish that cover crop, the cover crop seed itself. And then maybe if we're applying some nitrogen, those expenses would be included as well. So $50 per acre is what we're calling as our establishment cost. Based on our um, Iowa State research from those five years of spring grazing, on average, we ended up with about 900 pounds of dry matter um, per acre. So that's what we're gonna use in this scenario as our estimated um, tonnage of forage that we're gonna have from establishing this one acre. This would last a cow roughly 30 days, just a little bit shy. And so using that math, we're looking at about a dollar and 70 cents per cow per day um, when what it cost us for grazing that cover crop throughout um, using those establishment costs. So again, still significantly cheaper than providing that stored feed to those females. So the last little study I wanna talk about that Iowa State is working on is um, a study that is in conjunction with our agronomist and our beef extension team. And so this is um, happening at some of our outlying research farms. And really we wanted to compare some different species in terms of the feed quality and the tonnage that we could potentially have. So um, a lot of the research and um, out in the industry in the field itself too Cereal rye has kind of been the gold standard for the cover crop. Obviously, it has a lot of benefits where it's quick to establish. Um, it's still a little bit more active and growing than some of the other cool season species. And so it gives us a little bit quicker forage in the spring than some of the others. But we've been hearing questions from producers asking if this is really um, the cover crop species we should be chasing for a forage resource. Barley is something that's typically planted early in the spring and then um, would be taken as um, a hay or a silage crop prior to the um, cash crop being planted. And this is something that a lot of producers in Iowa have been asking, um, will it actually overwinter in Iowa? So we wanted to use barley just from that component. We have a wheat variety, so the typical hard red winter wheat. Um, obviously it's a, a little bit um, of a grain variety so it um, will be a little bit uh, quicker to establish in the fall and then it's later maturing. So it gives us a little bit longer to potentially graze in the spring compared to cereal rye. Because cover crops have been on a rise, there has been an increase in utilizing a variety of wheat that would be a forage wheat. And so we included one of these in the study as well, just because it's one that um, has been bred to not reach maturity as quickly as the, the hard red winter wheat variety. And then our fifth species would be triticale. And so this is just a mix of that wheat and cereal rye component. We also wanted to use some nitrogen fertilization in the study as well, just to demonstrate 
um, that potential for the yield response that we could see when utilizing that fertilizer. So this is a study, um, a picture taken from the study at our Armstrong Research Farm in Southwest Iowa this spring. And so you can see some of the variation in the height and the color of the, the forage plots that we see here. So I'll overlayer treatments here, and we can see some of that variation. Um, we see that darker color of green for those plots that had our N, our fertilizer that was applied compared to those that did not see that fertilizer. Um, I'd like to point out here too, in the back corners, we can see our barley plots um, and they look pretty bare and that's because there really wasn't much forage there. So obviously barley did not overwinter um, in this scenario for us. So lots of numbers here. Um, and, and again, we did this study at three of our outlying farms. So um, that would be kind of the variation in those columns that we're seeing there. But really what I wanna focus on um, is that response to nitrogen. So in general, a lot of our forage yield was somewhere in that one to two tons per acre, but we do see that nice boost in response to that nitrogen. So if we're serious about um, forage yield for a uh, resource for beef cattle and grazing, then nitrogen definitely does apply and um, is a, a good value to consider to boost that yield production. This here is just demonstrating our forage quality. Um, so we have each of our species there. There is a little bit of variation uh, just because our cereal rye was starting to head out. So it was a little bit more mature than some of these other forages that are listed. Um, so there is some variation there, but in general, when we compare this to our cool season vegetative pastures, so this would be something that would have been um, like sampled in the same time frame that early May component when we would be taking cows to grass. Just put the, there as a reference. Um, so you can see that in general, these cover crop species are a little bit higher in value um, than what our pastures would typically be. So the last thing I wanna end up with today is basically using some comments from producers who have been utilizing cover crops um, and just kind of some suggestions and uh, best management practices that they've implemented to make the, the most out of grazing cover crops. So the first is something I touched on right away. It's important to have a plan, but of course be flexible. We know that mother nature plays the biggest role in how much forage we will have available. Uh, commit to planning early. So basically this is um, indicating that the sooner we get that forage planted in the fall, the more likely that we're gonna be able to utilize it as a forage resource. Well, one producer probably said it best when he said that one day in the fall is like one week in the spring. So if we can get that cover crop planted just a day quicker in the fall, that gives us that much more grazing in the spring. Um, again, don't bank on being able to graze that, that forage. Um, it's something that um, is determinant of mother nature. When we have that resource, it's um, obviously something great to have, but it's not always gonna be there. So hopefully some of these tips we've talked about today can help increase the likelihood that you'll have that forage available. Of course, water and fencing is a big limitation for grazing cover crops, especially when we're integrating it into row crop enterprises. A lot of those fields don't have exterior fences, so we need to be considering that um, to, to make value of those resources. We talked about the moisture content of these species. So offering some dry matter, whether that's um, a hay bale, um, allowing those females access to um, an adjacent field or something else that maybe has some uh, dry matter, um, some forage resources along the fence line. Some of those things are beneficial as well. Another tip we talk about is when to start grazing that cover crop. So typically um, we'll hear like a, approximately a six to eight inches in height, but something else to do as well is to um, actually pull on that plant if we can um, snap off that plant, it's ready to be grazed versus if we pull out the roots, then it's not ready to be grazed yet. Um, so keep that in mind. That's a quick, old, a quick little test to try to implement on um, in the field itself. And then of course to make sure um, after we pull those livestock off, we allow that forage to regrow a little bit before we come in and apply that herbicide to terminate it before going to a cash crop. 
There are likely some alternatives that need to be adjusted on the row crop side just to integrate cover crops as a forage resource. Um, this might be um, some variety selection um, when we're applying some of those nutrients, looking at an alternative crop rotation, some of those things just so we can maximize that potential for the forage resource. Again, make sure that we're looking at those pesticide labels and uh, knowing those restrictions and also to making sure that we're following them. Lastly, I just want to um, acknowledge all of the, the beef and agronomy teams that have been working on these projects. Of course, we have a lot of Iowa State Research Farm staff that has been uh, big supporters too and are, are doing the heavy lifting on the farm for the majority of these projects. And then also too, a lot of these projects have been funded by external partners. Um, so we're, we're thankful for everybody that's been involved in the, the research with grazing cover crops at Iowa State. One last tip I'll provide. Um, so the Iowa Beef Center website, we also have kind of um, what we are calling an e-booklet for cover crop resources that we have uh, included on our website. And so this is something that um, has a lot of resources for grazing cover crops, species selections. Um, some of those things would be included here. So with that, thank you for joining today. And if you have any questions, I would be happy to take them.